Good evening, everyone. I'm Jim Morgan. I'm the producing artistic director of the ever so virtual York Theater Company, virtual and virtuous, I guess. This is the 22nd presentation in the York Theater's Show and Tell series, which revisits notable York productions and brings the people who created them back together for a virtual reunion. A little pandemic tried to interrupt the York's 50th anniversary celebration, but we figured out that this series is a great way to continue that celebration of our history. We're delighted to share these shows and the people who created them with you. You can find all of these programs on the York Theater's YouTube channel. Subscribing to our YouTube channel costs absolutely nothing and does great things for both of us. You'll be able to access all of our events simply and easily and helps build the York Theater's following in today's all important social media world. On January 4th, a Lexington Avenue water main break devastated much of our theater space, our archives, our equipment and our lives. We've had to vacate that space for an indefinite period of time while it's being remediated, reconstructed and repaired. It's been quite a difficult time on top of COVID-19 and everything else. Your donations are always essential in keeping our pandemic programming going. And at this time, donations are crucial. We sincerely appreciate your support of all kinds. We want to keep these events free. And to do that, we depend on your generosity. Various other virtual events will be happening throughout the coming months. Our new program, in the Pipeline, which takes a look at new works in development and their writers, will take place throughout the new year. Also, don't that forget that throughout the program tonight, you can type questions or comments into the chat feature at the bottom of your screen, and we will do our best to answer them when we find time. The show we are celebrating tonight, Beggar's Holiday, was presented in the Musicals in Mufti series in 1999. We've reunited members of the cast and the creative team and some special guests for tonight's discussion. Keep in mind this show was done 22 years ago on our old schedule for the Mufti series, which was four days, four and a half days of rehearsal and five performances over one weekend, all done in one seven day period. So asking people to remember back that far <laughs> is quite a, 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 quite a thing to ask of people. But the people we've gathered together tonight are game to try and we're delighted to have them with us. But first I'd like you to meet my cohort and co-host, my pandemic partner, Charles Wright, our resident theater historian. Charles is writing a book about the first 50 years of the York Theater Company. And he also happens to be the co-president of the Drama Desk. Charles? Well, good, good evening, everybody. Uh, just to situate this show in time, um, I'm, I'm going to ask a few questions of Kent Gash and Eric Hoggenson. Uh, this uh, Beggar's Holiday comes from the 1946-47 Broadway season, the same season as uh, Finian's Rainbow and Street Scene and Bloomer Girl and dramas such as All My Sons and The Iceman Cometh. Um, it's, of course, uh, by um, Duke Ellington, but Ellington's uh, collaborator was John Latouche, who, while not by any means unknown, is uh, uh, had a, a fairly brief career, uh, though a prolific one. Um, Eric, would you say a few words about, um, uh, about uh, Latouche Eric Hagenson is the author of the review, Taking a Chance on Love, which is about the life and career of Latouche uh, and was a uh, premiered at the York. Uh, John Latouche was a Southern boy uh, who was something of a prodigy, grew up in Richmond, Virginia, came to New York um, straight out of high school, attended Columbia University, but basically got thrown out after he wrote the um, varsity show and it was too ribald. Um, and his best known works are uh, Cabin in the Sky, uh, the song Ballad for Americans, uh, the, um, some of the lyrics for Can the Leonard Bernstein Candide, uh, The Golden Apple, uh, and um, the opera The Ballad of Baby Doe, um, among many, many others. He was very prolific. He died 
uh, at the age of only 41 of a heart attack. So his career was tragically cut short. Um, for Beggar's Holiday, he was approached by uh, the producer, Perry Bruskin, I believe. Perry Watkins. Perry Watkins, Perry Watkins, sorry. Um, and uh, Watkins had the idea for an updated version of the Beggar's Opera. Uh, and he wanted it to be something that featured all races equally. Uh, and so he put together an interracial team to write it, which was John Latouche and Duke Ellington. And when they were going out of town, when the show was first announced, uh, one thing that struck me about the press release from that time was that uh, the, um, the producers described the, uh, the cast uh, or the proposed cast, I guess this was before it went out of town, but when it was first announced as being um, uh, uh, to be composed of many people of many ethnic backgrounds, yes. not just black and white. Yes, many. Um, the show, of course, is based on or inspired by John Gay's uh, The Beggar's Opera, the great 18th century um, uh, satire. Um, Kent, could you give us just a thumbnail sketch of uh, the, the story of Beggar's Holiday and the principal characters? It's really, as you say, it's inspired by um, The Beggar's Opera. And so it is very much the story of a central figure that's based on McKeith, uh, who is tied up in uh, a lot of uh, petty crimes and a lot of romantic assignations, uh, very popular amongst a lot of women. Uh, and, um, and also then it involves sort of characters based on the Peachum family uh, as they exist in, uh, who ultimately become kind of a nemesis for McKeith because he's the involved with their daughter, uh, Polly, uh, and much to the chagrin of, of Mr. Peachum and his wife. Um, and it's really, you know, the life of this sort of underworld uh, of, of characters and all that they get into. And of course, Beggar's Opera was also the uh, source material for the Brecht Vial Beggar's um, Three Penny Opera. Right. So, you know, a lot of these pieces are very much about, you know, are very much about class as well. And, you know, what we do to get, to get by and to get through. And in Beggar's Holiday, there's a sense of, of something that doesn't really exist in Beggar's Opera or in Three Penny Opera is there's, there's a kind of, there's a sense of sort of hope. And yes, the material is still somewhat satiric at times, but of the three pieces, um, I actually feel, and this is not a fact, this is just an opinion, uh, but of the three pieces, I feel like Beggar's Holiday actually has the truest heart of the three. Um, uh, the Beggar's Holiday, the songs are still intended to make you feel something and to connect on some level with the characters. Um, whereas I don't know that anybody's going to the Three Penny Opera with an intention of connecting to the characters. It's about a deeper thing, you know, that Brecht is trying to tell us politically. And yes, that music is glorious too, but it, fun you know, they function pretty differently. So, I mean, I think that's a, the other thing about Baker's Holidays, uh, we were talking about this earlier, Charles and I, is it is one of the few musicals after Shuffle Along, really, to begin to center jazz as a, as a, a musical form used theatrically. And there's just not a lot of musicals that are, that tried to do that with any, especially with any kind of book, you know, and there's no way you hear that score, there's no way Yes, there are some Broadway influences or you feel a little nod or homage or tip of the hat to a certain kind of thing, but 
you know, it is jazz through and through and through and through and through and through and through in a way that, um, you know, we really still don't hear a great deal in the musical theater. And it's really a miraculous kind of score in that way. Um, because it's undeniable, feels undeniably like Ellington and Strayhorn and Luther Henderson and all of them are echoing in it like crazy, you know, it's a special thing. I would add to that just about the music is that although that all of that is true, it is a remarkably savvy theater score. Oh my God, yes. It is written understanding what theater is supposed to do and how to depict character and how to move plot and all of that. Uh, and, you know, Ellington had never done that before, but he certainly knew what he was doing. Right. Pierre, well, and I think, and I think John Latouche has, an, uh, has a huge hand in the function, uh, in that sort of the mechanics of how does the musical, how does a piece of musical theater actually work? Yeah. You know? um, uh, but certainly that part of the collaboration, even though the show was fraught with enormous difficulty, uh, as many shows are, you know, um, I think you're right, I would agree with that, definitely. If I can jump in here, uh, we are delighted to have with us um, as a special guest, uh, the granddaughter of the gentleman listed as the composer, Mercedes Ellington is with us tonight. Mercedes, did you, were you involved with our production at all or did you just see it? I remember you being there, but, uh, did you advise on it? I uh, I wasn't involved in it, but I remember seeing it, and I'm I'm still learning to this day. I mean, the the Ellington catalog consists of almost uh, three thousand pieces of music, and I'm wading through this thing, and I knew he had always had aspirations of being on Broadway for some reason. I think whether it was to legitimize his sound or whether it was to experience the feeling of a steady gig, you know, because instead of touring so much, I mean, their lives were always based on tours all over the world. Everywhere I go, um, you know, Rush, whether it's Russia, Japan or what, he's always been there before me. The only place that I went to recently uh, because I'm a ballroom dance competitor was Cuba. And they, he, they never got to Cuba because of the uh, Cuban mis missile crisis. So, they, they had all of these travels and I think he welcomed the fact that they would be in one place for a period of time. And that was attractive to him. And, yeah. and also because it, it, it honed the band because the band was able to really get into the music and into the, the play of things. And they were not so discombobbled because I have stories about the band on the bus, you know, that's like really ridiculous. And, um, and, and this was, a, this was a, a chance for him to succeed on Broadway also in a venue and a place and time where people of color were not necessarily accepted to cross over into areas that were not specifically designated as their territory. Have there been full productions of this show that you have seen? Not that I've seen, not that I've heard of, nothing. And uh, let's take a minute and hear from everyone on our panel tonight. Um, uh, and then we'll get back to talking about the show itself. Uh, Mercedes, where are you talking to us from? What have you been up to in these strange months we're all experiencing? Well, I talked to you now about the band traveling today. I just want to tell you a story. Um, and this is a true story. Um, when the band was traveling through the South, uh, at this period of time, what they did was they went to the venue, they rehearsed, and then there was a period of time that they had to themselves where they usually got on a city bus and toured to see the, the sites. And then they came back for the performance at night. And this particular time, Barney Bagard, who was Reed player, he was from Louisiana and he was light skinned with straight hair and he was in a group of, of musicians who were touring. And when they got on the bus, Barney sat down right opposite the driver. And the other musician said, hey, Barney, no, you better come to the back of the bus. We're supposed to be in the back of the bus. You know where we are. So Barney said, no, I'm sitting right here. 
and they fought back and forth, back and forth. And so they said, okay, well, you be in jail. We're going to be at the performance tonight. So they went to the back of the bus and Barney was sitting there and the bus driver got up and went over to Barney and said, you supposed to be in the back of the bus. And Barney said, no, I'm sitting right here. And the bus driver said, no, you're supposed to be in the back of the bus. And Barney said, no, but I am Creole. And the bus driver said, I don't care how old you are. <laughs> True story. That, that's great. And what, what time period was that? It must have been in the 40s. 40s, yeah. Mr. Gash, uh, yes. you're obviously underwater somewhere. Uh, yeah, I'm actually, uh, I'm, I'm right here in New York. Um, uh, but I, um, I have to, I use this as my virtual background. This is from the it's aquarium, my nod to my days as Associate Artistic Director of the Alliance Theater in Atlanta. Um, but yeah, I'm here in New York and I'm, uh, what am I up to? I run the new studio on Broadway, which is the NYU Tisch School of the Arts uh, musical theater program. Uh, so we're teaching both, you know, virtually and in person. And I'm, you know, working on a bunch of other project and projects and directing things virtually and as we all are, um, and happy to be booked in 2022 uh by some theaters that feel strongly about being in production uh but nobody before the end of uh 2021 so you know i'm eager to see what the theater becomes post pandemic because it can't there's no going back time doesn't go back uh we can only go forward and we must go forward and be better and so I'm very eager to be a part, hopefully, of something new uh, that is vital and robust and has something to do with who we are and how we live now. Because there's certainly lots to be explored and lots of people's stories to tell. So, you know, good Lord willing and the creek, creek don't rise, I'll be, you know, be back at it. We're with you. That's great. Tammy Swartz, where are you and what have you been up to? And also tell everyone, tell who you were in this production, if you remember. It's okay. Oh, I do, I do, I do. Well, uh, yeah, I, I call, uh, my name is Tommy Swartz. Um, oh, Tommy, excuse me. You knew, you knew that 21 years ago, you did. I did, I did. <laughs> I knew a lot of things 21 years ago. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the, um, where am I? Well, I'm, I'm still based in New York City, um, but I have been sequestering with my octogenarian parents in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, um, throughout most of the pandemic with quick trips back and forth to the city to take care of some business and things. And what I'm doing now, um, I, uh, in 2018, the board of Harrisburg Opera Association voted me in to be artistic director and executive director of that arts organization. And I relaunched the company with initiative to not only produce grand opera, but to do other forms of music and eventually bring in theater dance and um, as, as well to the mix. Uh, and uh, I have an emphasis uh, on diversity casting and we also have philanthropic uh, programs that were in development currently and uh, educational programs that are attached to uh, our main stage production and outreach concert. And it's all devoted toward the betterment of people's lives in central Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, our creed is artistry, originality, diversity, community, and philanthropy. And interesting, we, we had to obviously go virtually as well with concerts um, and video performances instead of live performances. And the George Floyd um, debacle that happened in May uh, inspired me to put a lot of these things together in a film that celebrated our community of colors and color in a very positive way this summer. Um, and on top of that, I'm, I'm still acting. I, I had two films come out this year that I filmed last year you know, before the pandemic came out and 
And uh, can't wait though, to be able to feel like I can safely audition for things again and, and move forward with this, this arts organization that I am so, so grateful to be in charge of and guiding and stewarding, especially during this time. That's exciting. <laughs> and who, who were you in the show? Did oh, you... um, I was Polly, oh, <laughs> one of Jerry's Polly. many girlfriends. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Ken Primus, where are yes. you talking to us from and who were you in the show and what have you been up to and how are you surviving in these very strange times? Well, I'm kind of loving it, you know, uh, these times in a way. Um, I live in Las Vegas, Nevada, have been for almost nine years. Uh, I travel back and forth. Before the pandemic, I was traveling back and forth to do commercial auditions and movie auditions. Now I have the equipment and all the things I need. I do it all from here. In fact, I just finished a song for Michael Colby. I do recording for people. Michael Colby just had me do a song yesterday, just finished yesterday. I do... Uh, lots of auditions, which is, makes it easier for me instead of that four and a half hours from Las Vegas to New York, to LA to audition one word. Um, I just do it from here, which is very great. You know, it was ter terrific. Um, I don't remember who I was. Okay. <laughs> I do. You were. Oh, good. Yeah. Tell me. You were Hamilton Peachum. There you go. There you go. Excellent. You were my daddy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we look so much alike. <laughs> no, but I'm not doing anything extraordinary. I'm, I'm, uh, like I said, I do a lot of auditioning. I, I've been very blessed because my agent calls me, and then I, re you know, I, I send it out. I send out auditions all the time, self tapes. Uh, that's why I have this green screen. No, it's not up now. But green screen and circle light and all this, and it makes it much easier for me because I can spend the day doing a great audition and send it out, as opposed to four and a half, four and a half, five hours traveling into LA, which I was doing for a while, you know? So it's great. It really is. I, uh, I'm a happy guy. We're very sunny here. Um, Different is kind of cool, but not bad. Um, and I like living in Las Vegas. I really do. I, it's it's amazing. But I'm just auditioning, hoping something else comes, by, comes around at one point. That's it. We should just mention that Hamilton Peachum was the character um, created in 1946 by Zero Mostel in his first Broadway appearance. Ah. It was a great success for Zero Mostel. Excellent, excellent. I remember it being a fun time, but I don't remember much else about it. It's been many years and many shows between here, there, and now. So, um, no, I don't remember a lot. As, as I told you guys when you called, I was like, I don't know what this is. So, you know. But yeah, that's me. That's what I'm doing. Jim, at this point, we should introduce Joe McConnell. Uh, Joe is um, uh, situated in our Hollywood Squares uh, arrangement uh, with Eric Hoganson. Um, and um, Joe was the casting director for this show. Absolutely. Being on Beggar's Holiday was an interesting opportunity. I had joined the York Theater's staff in the late summer of 1999, a position was created whereby I was both their resident casting director and their director of development. So it was an interesting portfolio. Has, uh, that, first, has that combination ever happened in any other theater in the history? I of doubt it. But the, but the first big project I jumped into when I started was the three Muffies that we did that fall. Uh, and I confess I was particularly excited about Beggar's Holiday. I was a bit familiar with the piece because several years before that, uh, there was a sort of semi bootleg LP that came out with the demo recordings that were recorded by the original cast members, by Avon Long and Alfred Drake and Libby Holman and the people who were involved in the original. Uh, so I was always intrigued by this piece. Uh, in an earlier part of my career, I actually spent some time working in Atlanta, so I was familiar with Kent and his work, so I was very much looking forward to that. And of course, the minute that he and I started collaborating, I love the fact that he was very committed to making this as ethnically diverse as we could. Um, I mean, we were lucky. We got some of the creme de la creme of the... Uh, 
Black Broadway community you're performing when you have Ken Primus and Jerry Dixon and Amy Joe and Lashans and Pam Isaacs, it didn't get better than that. But we rounded things out with a wide range of people. And I was particularly excited when we found Tommy, who was fairly young in her career, uh, and of course, legitimately trained voice and brought an Asian presence to the cast. And I loved having that. I love doing it. And I remember like yesterday, how kind you were to me at the audition and, and Kent too. You were great. I mean, you know, anybody who comes in and really great, it's really easy, you know, it just. Uh... Well, you know, I, I, I remember I also had done a lot of concerts of Kurt Weil at the time. Um, and on top of that, had a jazz background, which was beautiful. And then I just remember telling people, I got, I got cast with a whole bunch of famous people in me <laughs> for my off-Broadway debut. <laughs> I, will tell a, I will tell a story, if I may, about one of the casting choices that didn't happen. Um, when you're a casting director and you're putting a show together, it goes to a thing called Breakdown Services, which goes to all of the agents, and they submit their clients that you should be considering. And sometimes the agents call you and say, you know, I have a client that would really, really like to be seen for this. Would you do this as a favor? She'd really like to come in. I thought, okay, this was a woman who had had some good success in a fairly recent Broadway show and was trying to move her career forward. Um, and she came in and was lovely and actually sang and was nice to all of us, but it just, it didn't fit. And I would talk to Ken and we'd go, you know, we know she's very talented, but there just doesn't seem to be the right slot for her in this show. So lamentably, we had to pass and go on to other people. Um, her name was Adina Menzel, and I don't know what happened to her. I knew when you started the story, I thought, oh, I know where this is going. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, and it was, uh, I don't know, I felt like this had to be a special group of people I mean, every ca every director says that whenever they're casting, I guess. But uh, and I'm certainly not the only director here who could talk about this. But I do think this was a combination of many things. A, it was people who had to be fast, you know, that I could give one or two notes to and know that they would run with it and go ahead and create something, and and down to a person, every single person came with such, and also they had to be uh, quick learners too, because it wasn't a score that was out there that you could go get the Broadway cast recording or the revival recording or some recording and listen to it and just knock it off and learn it quickly that way. So they had to be able to absorb the music quickly. And the music is not always, is not by any means simplistic. So there was a lot of music that had to be learned. I needed people with strong personalities, with thrilling voices, great heart, and a lot of sort of primal sex appeal. It had to be a stage full of people that you thought, hmm, hmm. With every person who stepped on stage, you thought, well, yes, that's lovely. That's very nice, you know? And that's because that's a part of the world too. There is that sensuality in the world of the piece. And if it's not there in every person, the piece isn't gonna work. And so we got really, really fortunate because wildly talented people who could sing like one voice, every bit as glorious as the next. And then who also were really, really easy on the eyes and the heart and the everything else. There was a lot of beauty on that stage of all kinds. And that was thrilling. And I felt like that was part of the intention of the original creators, which are trying to sort of tap into that. What's beautiful about every race, what's beautiful about everybody and what's beautiful about how they're all intermingling like crazy and not ever really talking about the fact that like, oh, you're a different race, but I'm up here with you. You know, we're just in it doing what we do. And that was wonderful to see, you know. Hey, I was Highbinder and some other lascivious characters. Yeah. Um, but I went on after uh, 
I kind of put performing behind me and was a casting director for a while with uh, Telsey and Company. So, and now I direct and choreograph. So I wanna speak to Joe and to Kent. This experience totally inspired me in the work I did in casting because otherwise the shows I had done were West Side Story, South Pacific, where there, there were multiracial casts, but each race had its side of the fence. And this experience really opened my eyes up to the kind of casting director I wanted to be uh, in wanting to see productions in a new way. And I got to do some of that. So thank you for that, Joe. And uh, Kent, what I learned from working with you was you let us go, but you guided us at the same time. So as a director, the most valuable lesson for me was how to harness whatever you can from your actors and let them play, let them experiment. And then you, as a director, really kind of shaped the whole thing and brought us to the finish line. So for me, this was, even though it was a short experience, it was, it was a great learning experience. So thank you for that. Thank you. Amy Jo Phillips, where, where are you and who were you in the show and what have you been up to all of those questions? Oh my goodness. Um, I am still in New York City. I'm a native New Yorker. I'm planning to retire in Vegas, Ken, so I'll be looking you up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, uh, still in New York City, I um, currently, uh, I took a sidetrack uh, taking care of my dad and kind of stepped away from show business for a while. And uh, in that time frame, I became a tax preparer. So now during this pandemic, I am working for TurboTax. <laughs> Hence the collared shirt and the glasses. <laughs> so I work for TurboTax and I have my own small uh, tax preparation firm, AJ Phillips Tax Boutique. And um, yeah, uh, that's what I've been doing. I still do perform. Uh, the pandemic shut down. I was supposed to go to Goodspeed uh, last summer. And so we're on pause for that. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Beggar's Holiday. Uh, Tommy, you said, oh, it was your off-Broadway to debut with all these people. That's the way I felt. It's like oh. when I walked into the room with Jerry and Michelle <laughs> again. I mean, though I had already had a Broadway credit and you know, it, I just still felt like I was in this room with these amazing, amazing performers and just to get to play with all of you. And I, I, Joe, I'm sorry, but I have such a vivid memory of you. Like we had this trio thing with adding going through numbers. That's what's like in my mind. I think it was me, you and Ken, and, and it's like, that's my memory. And it, and it was just so much fun to play with everybody. So I, I thank you, Joe, I thank you, Ken, and I thank the company for, for allowing me to be part of this amazing, amazing experience. Now, well, mentioning the music, the musical end of this production was in truly wonderful hands. The great, incredible, Genius, Wunderkind, Luther Henderson. Ugh. I mean, where do you even begin? You know, I mean, Juilliard and uh, then, you know, Juilliard, the work with his, his close relationship with Billy Strayhorn, uh, his incredible work on so many Broadway shows, for Julie Stein, for Richard Rogers. I mean, you know, it just, and then we can't even talk about Ain't Misbehavin' and what I think is probably the best musical ever written about the black experience, Jelly's Last Jam, which, I mean, what do you even, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and what I loved about Luther is he would always give you the straight dope. You know, you never had to guess what he was thinking. You never had to, you know, always like tell you right away, straight. And then, and it was always, it was always in pursuit of the best work that you had in you. You know, he always sort of seemed to feel like he was always trying to tease out a little extra something from you. 
that one thing that you thought, oh, well, I don't do that, or I don't sing like that, or I don't really do, that would be the thing that he'd be like, no, come over here and do this for me, you know? And because he believed you could do it somehow, you did it, you know? And I don't know, that ability to inspire other people uh, to a version of themselves or of their talent that they don't even know they can fully access yet. That's a really rare gift. You know, he was, he was something. And he was the music supervisor. Well, Luther, Luther wanted to adopt me. Luther and his first wife, Tilly. They were, Luther went to, went to high school with my father, um, Evander Childs. And uh, he wanted to adopt me and my grandmother said no. In any, in any case, Luther had always been weaving in and out of my life. And Luther was also one of the people, one of Ellington's arrangers that he, that he sent to Juilliard. Ellington used to send like Billy and Quincy and Luther and my father, all of his arrangers, he would have them go to Juilliard for not maybe the whole uh, period of time to get a degree or a, a diploma, but they all went because he always depended on them to come back with the absolute structure within, you know, so he could play. And then they would say, oh no, let's do this. Or, you know, put the bar line here. And, uh, and, and pin him down because a lot of times Ellington would just go off into the stratosphere, you know, so he would have them as his base ba to, to advise him as to what is possible with different things. And it was a, it was a really a, an incredible relationship that was garnered between all of these people who really work together. And you don't see that so much nowadays. You see, everybody's trying to take credit for their own thing, you know, and this collaborative spirit is, is very much in, 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 I don't know where, it's on Mars. I don't know where it is. But there are a, a theaters, theaters like yours, like the York, where you have a base of people and getting back to theater groups, it's a very rare thing. I assume that, uh... Luther brought in Leonard Oxley as the actual music director. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Let's let's uh, keep going through the uh, lineup. Uh, Lana Gordon, where are you, and um, uh, what have you been up to, and who were you in the show, and all of that? Well, I had to look and see who I was, so I, I cheated. Um, so I was Flora. <laughs> um, I'm in New York City. Um, before the pandemic, I um, was doing. A Wonderful World in Miami, Miami New Drama, playing one of the four, one of the four wives of Louis Armstrong, Lil Hardin. So, um, but I must say when I walked into the room 1999, I was just starstruck. So that was just my memory. LaShawn sitting next to LaShawn's. I'm like, oh my God. So that was one of my memories. Um, what have I been doing? I've been very fortunate. I got a chance to do one night only. Um, Best of Broadway on NBC as Velma Kelly um, representing Chicago. And I was very fortunate that they chose the, the girl with the curly hair. So, um, and voiceovers, I'm, you know, have a little voiceover studio set up. So I'm just, you know, plugging away, just trying to find new avenues and self tapes and learning a lot about myself during this time and grateful, being grateful. And Kent, it's so nice to hear your voice, it's so comforting because coming from Lion King as a dancer, it was like my first job as a singer, you know? And now I am I didn't singing. remember. I didn't remember that. Yes, because I was- I, I always think of you as a singer. I mean, right. not, I don't think of you as a dancer too, but- But no, you were the first and just hearing your voice and what you have to say, it's just, you know, it gives me hope and, that we're just gonna make it through this time and better well, than- We don't better. have any choice about that. <laughs> you know, too much to do. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so glad, anyway. glad to see you. Good I remember, I mean, the Mufties are always intense because it's uh, not enough time to do these very ambitious shows uh, that you don't have time to really learn and everyone just gives it their all and that's what's so amazing about it. But I remember this being a, a, an intense, but loving, incredibly loving uh, 
there was just this feeling of that as you walk down the hall that everyone was so intent on doing the best they could, absolute best they could for everyone involved and for particularly for this material that was uh, so worthy of the effort. Uh, Jerry Dixon. Uh, hi, I'm Jerry Dixon. I am in New York, by the way. Uh, uh, in 2018, like Tommy, I became an artistic director. Uh, I am still an artistic director at Village Theater out in, uh, near Seattle, and uh, it's been a trip to, to Zoom artistic direct uh, all these miles away while I'm in New York. Uh, but we continue to do the work that Kent was mentioning. We move forward because we have to. Um, and it's been it's been such a privilege to uh, to to move us all forward together. And um, one of the things we keep coming back to is that we want to do it together. We're not trying to make a, a theater all one thing. We're trying to make it all things together. So uh, I've been appreciating that about my my team and and my theater and all the artists that I do that with. Um, I was McHeath all those many years ago. Uh, I, they were so, uh, I, I thought I remembered nothing. And then when you all started talking, it, things started flooding back. Like I, I, I'm a, a highly organized person and, and sometimes maybe a little bit anal retentive. And I split my script up into 20 pieces and put them around the stage where Kent had me staged. So I could just pick them up and have just like 10 pages instead of 30. <laughs> that was one memory, crazy. Um, and then I also remember Luther standing while I was learning, maybe I should change my ways. And that particular song is like actor meet lyric, actor meet melody. And the, the fusion of those two things were, were such a roadmap because I thought, just the book alone was telling me some things about McKeith, but it was the complexity of the songs that really got me to where this dude wanted to be. And I think about, I think about the form of maybe I should change my ways. It's, I believe, if I'm right about my music, A, B, C instead of A, B, A, or even A, A, and B. The form is so complex. It says, oh, this person's got some stuff going on. He's, he can't just sing you a straight form ballad. Even the, the, the opening song, In Between, is such an odd take on a look at the world. This tells you this guy's not just a thief. If he can be that self-aware about talking about the in-betweens of his life, where does he go? Is it this way or that way? If he can say, maybe I should change my ways in the fourth song, this is a person of complexity and not just this sort of rogue. Um, so I always bow down to writers in that way is that you, they, if you don't know where to go, listen to the writer and they will tell you every single time if they're good. And those two were some of the best. Absolutely. Um, we, uh, we have a member of the music, uh, staff with us tonight, Jeffrey Smith. Uh, Jeffrey, can you tell us what you did on the show? Yeah. So I was, I was the rehearsal accompanist. Um, and like some of the other cast here, it was for me, I think my first off Broadway show, uh, fresh out of college. And so I also was starstruck by this cast and by the amazing Luther Henderson. I mean, I just blown away, uh, to be able to work under him and, you know, of course, very nervous playing the piano in front of him, <laughs> but, uh, what, what an amazing experience incredible experience. Um, right now I'm, I live in South Jersey. So I'm in Jersey, um, right outside Philadelphia. And I'm the artistic director and conductor of the Philadelphia Boys Choir. Um, so we, we take boys, young boys, train them up, get them singing some great music until their voices change. And then we got to get a new crop of boys in every year, you know. Um, it's quite an experience. Right now we're doing everything virtually still. We are preparing for a tour. We were supposed to go to South Africa this summer, um, but we've changed it to Puerto Rico because it's a little closer and with the pandemic and all, we're hoping that's still feasible, but we'll see. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're, we're managing to get through this. And um, also in my spare time, I play piano with the Philly Pops Orchestra and occasionally with the Philadelphia Orchestra. 
Um, so I haven't been in New York in quite some time. So it's it's a wonderful. I'm I'm really glad to be able to see everyone and and hear what everybody's up to. In between, neither confident nor fearful. In between, neither happy. Half in a mist and half wide away. You wait for the moment when something will break. Your heart is clean of the given and the getting. You're in between, neither hoping nor regretting. You're a feather. amazing the uh, the quality of that you assume it was someone with a little uh, I don't know cassette recorder at that time or uh, 1999 what would that have been that that just broke me out in flop sweats that that was an out of body experience listening to that <laughs> the photographs that we have to show are not obviously from our production they're from the Broadway production uh, maybe we should go to some of those now and uh, we can also talk about the cast, that incredible cast from the Broadway production. And an incredible staff as well. It was uh, directed by first by John Houseman, who left the production and left it in the hands of his um, assistant, Nicholas Ray of um, um, movie fame, uh, Rebel Without a Cause, for instance. And um, then in the waning days of the out of town tour, uh, while they were in Boston, George Abbott joined the uh, joined the lineup and um, worked on the book and uh, directed um, and it came into town with Nicholas Ray as the credited director and what year was that 1946 it was Christmas time 1946 so it ran 111 performances into the spring of uh, 1947 well and it was yeah it was, it was rare that a musical, with Alfred Drake, you know, star of Oklahoma and Kiss Me Kate. And it was rare in a musical that a musical with Alfred Drake in it would not have been a success. You know, um, even Kismet was a huge hit, even though, although some of that may have been the responsibility of a newspaper strike so the critics couldn't see it until after it had already won the Tony. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, without having seen the original production, it's impossible to know, but with such great musical information, with such a great score, really tough uh, that, that it was not a bigger success. Um, and such great people in it, Alfred Drake, Zero Mostel, Avon Long, uh, film and theater director Herbert Ross was in the chorus. I mean, it was- Marge fun. Champion, Marge, Marge Champion. It was been known as uh, Marjorie Bell. Yeah, yeah, it's really, um, you know, I wanna say, and this is, I might be picking at a wound, so I won't say a lot about it, but, um, you know, Dale Wasserman uh, is a complex guy and his uh, participation or, you know, he was a, played a big role in our, in this Mufti concert. And he was really responsible in many ways for the restructured script that we were using. Uh, although it's interesting, you know, that Luther had some fairly strong feelings about that, 
Um, and Luther had very strong uh, memories uh, and connections, of course, with Billy Strayhorn and with Duke. And there were things that Luther felt and wanted to make sure got back into the score uh, when we did it that had that Dale had sort of eliminated. So there was, it was interesting watching them sort of negotiate each other very quickly as we tried to arrive at a performable version. Um, you know, I have a really strong hope that this, that the piece could have a life uh, in the future. And in fact, we were, we attempted to do it and to really go into the process of doing it at the Alliance when I was there. Um, and there were some things, there were some obstacles that pr proved insurmountable um, at the time. And I have to say without saying more than what I'm about to say is some of those obstacles lay with Dale. Uh, so it was complex, it was complicated, as many things are. But boy, what a lovely piece of work to be a part of. Well, the odyssey of the, the musical, the original production was, was rocky as well. Um, you saw that um, the, uh, the material, the, uh, the playbill for Twilight Alley, um, uh, Latouche called the show uh, uh, early on Beggar's Holiday, but he also considered uh, the title Street Music. And when uh, the show went out of town, it went out of town as Twilight Alley and then came back as uh, into, into New York as, as uh, with the Beggar's Holiday name reattached. Do we know if part of the reconsideration from street music was connected to the Kurt Vile Langston Hughes street scene, which opened in the same season? It was the same season too. I, I think I mentioned that. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I, I don't. I don't know that. Uh, there's been speculation that Beggar's Holiday was attractive as a title because there had been um, a number of shows uh, like Shoemaker's Holiday and Blues Holiday. Um, that um, used that word and had been successful. This is the one photograph that we have uh, from our production with Kent, Leonard Oxley, Luther Henderson, and Dale Wasserman. Um, it's just interesting to have this one snapshot. We don't even have the cast photograph um, oh. that we normally took at that time, but it's, it's great to see this group of people. Kent, do you remember how this came to be, uh, this production? Uh, my, my, memory is, uh, my memory of it was that um, at the time I was represented, my agent was also Dale Wasserman's agent. And I, she contacted me about doing it um, and said that I needed to, you know, would have to have a conversation with Dale. So I, you know, I had heard of it and was really interested in it, but didn't, you know, did some research and everything. And then was really keen on being a part of it because I just, like anybody with ears, loved Duke Ellington, you know, like had grown up with so much of his music. And so, you know, that's, uh, my memory of it was that I got vetted by Dale and then it was on and we were, we were, I, we were doing it. Um, I don't, I don't know more than that. Uh, who but I was your agent? That part of the process. Uh, her name, her name was Barbara Hoganson. Oh, Barbara. Oh, that must yeah. be how I met Barbara. Yeah. Uh, she also represented the Latouche estate. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I mean, she was one of the loveliest people ever. I mean, seemingly far too kind to be a great agent. And she, but she really was. I loved working with her. 
Um, and I think I think she's still still doing things. I'm elsewhere, absolutely. But, she she yeah. represents the piece that I mentioned earlier, um, based on the Glass Menagerie, Blue Roses by Mimi Ford, Mimi Turk, and Nancy Ford. Oh, she, wonderful! She's very yeah. active. Yeah, yeah, good, good, because she's great. She was really, really great. I'd forgotten that. Maybe that's how it happened. I think that is how it happened. Mildred Smith Hepburn, uh, as she became known, I guess, after she married, uh, was part of a talk back uh, after one of these performances. Um, I remember going up with Eric to uh, some, Larchmont or something like that to pick her up in a car to bring her down to see the show and, um, and be a part of a talk back afterwards. Uh, these uh, photographs Eric found online and we are very grateful to some have. Of them, some of them are online. Some of them uh, I actually had in my collection because um, they had been used in the John Latouche biography of which I helped with research, et cetera. So, so some of them I already had, uh, this one in particular. Uh, but there's a story connected with um, Mildred Smith as Lucy Lockett. Uh, John Latouche's significant other, Kenward Elmsley, uh, they were not together uh, when this was produced. Kenward was in college then and he saw the show in Boston uh, and he went back like five or six times and then he went to saw it in, saw it in New York and he became obsessed with John Latouche because he thought the, the writing was so good. Um, but he told me that uh, every single time he saw the show, when Alfred Drake seriously and romantically kissed Mildred Smith, people got up and left. Wow. Yeah. It tells you something about the society that it was produced in. Yeah. Here's Valerie Bettis, who was the, um, the choreographer of this show mm -hmm. with Mr. Ellington and Mr. Latouche. And interestingly, clearly, choreography was supposed to be a major component of the show because I know some of the earliest cast members hired for Twilight Alley were the dancer Paul Godkin, who was very highly regarded as a trained ballet and modern dancer. He was one of the alternates in the original Fancy Free, was a Jerome Robbins dancer, was a Dennis Sean trained dancer, et cetera. And then his partner hired to be with him was a young California transplant named Marjorie Bell. Right. who, right after Baker's Holiday, got a dance partner named Gower Champion and married. Yep. Well, and her, so and her, that, that Marge Champion was able to be one of the talkbacks when we did the production. Yeah, and Herb Ross, Herb Ross. Was, uh, was a very strong dancer as well. Um, you know, and went on to do some of his own choreo choreographic. And Avon Long, I mean, wow. Spectacular. Who did the scenery for the um, original? Oliver, <laughs> Oliver Smith. It, I was going to say, I thought that's who it was. Oliver Smith. And yeah. apparently it was uh, in John Hausman's autobiography, he talks about how wonderful he thought the scenery was. And he said, it's so wonderful that Smith reused a lot of it in West Side Story. <laughs> right, well, the bridge. This bridge shot, you know, looks suspiciously like going into the rumble. Mm, under the highway. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. There yeah. were financial problems with the, uh, with the show. And so in New Haven, um, they worked on a bare stage because the, uh, uh, the, there was a lean on the, the scenery until the, uh, the, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the producers could raise some more money. So they performed actually on a bare stage? Not for the whole New Haven run, but just oh, at oh, the beginning uh, of it. They, they got the scenery out of heart. Good. Uh, we have another song to listen to, No One But You. No one else but you On a crowded avenue In a sea of empty faces Only Oh, uh -huh. 
song that pays off really well and at the end of the show Mac ends up with all three of the women and he's it to to all three of them at the same time I, I was, not, no one else but you and you and you I, I just that came right into my head when you when when we were here I just started cracking up at the reprise of it and it was it was jaunty it was like no one else but you it was like it was a faster tune at the at the reprise it was hysterical eric you were talking about a um a different version of the ending that uh john latouche wrote yeah um the whole process of this show as is the case often for uh artists who are transgressive as john always was uh, working in the commercial realm uh, is how much can you get away with? And that's a, a running battle. Uh, and he certainly fought it his whole life. Um, he talked about when he first started writing this that he wanted this, he wanted to bring hope to it, as Kent said. Uh, he didn't want it to be as slashingly satirical as the three penny had been as bitter as that show is. But he wanted to catch what he called that strange combination of dread and hope. Um, and uh, in the original first, there are three drafts that exist. There's, there's a very early draft. There's an interim draft that we think is basically what went out of town. And then there is the final draft that matches what ended up on Broadway. Um, and in the um, original draft, the beggar was a character who uh, wove through uh, and constantly commented on the action and, and had dialogues uh, with uh, McKeith. Um, uh, the character of the beggar went through some particularly notable transformations. Latouche initially imagined this figure as someone who looks, acts, and sings like Lead Belly. In fact, he should be Lead Belly. <laughs> he conceived him as a cryptic figure, um, asking questions of which he already knows the answers, commenting with wisdom and tolerance on the hectic saga which is actually being dreamed up in his mind. Um, and in the first draft, he appears throughout the action with a guitar in hand, singing folk-like quatrains that respond to the action and telling McKeith, he then told McKeith this at the player's climax. This was John's original ending. You see how it is, Matt. Look at the lathered pack of mankind, hysterical, jittery, anxious, jumping this way and that, snapping and biting at whatever passes before their furious jaws, looking for a blame in this man's color, a scapegoat in that man's race, running frantically before the shadow of their illogical fear, trapped in the arid gullies of their hatred, and always refusing to track it down to where it hides in the secret shadows of his own heart. The deed has been done by all of us. The hates hated by all of us, the bombs released, the triggers pulled, the mines laid, the victims destroyed by all of us. The one thing we equally share in this unequal world is guilt. And that Somebody tell me that that doesn't need to be on a stage right now. Oh, that yeah. Oh, yeah. Come on. But that got changed to a yeah. joke about, I can't kill off the hero. It's a musical comedy. Right. <laughs> Which is what the ending was on Broadway. Wow. I mean, this is, we have to, re you know, I, I think it's hard to remember. Um, and maybe it's good that it's hard to remember, but you know, there was a, this is the same world where Rogers and Hammerstein were told you have to cut, you've got to be carefully taught. Three years later. They were told, yeah. And this was before that. So, and if they, if people were saying that to them, 
to which they were powerful enough to say, well, you know, we'll close the show before we'll cut it. So it's not going anywhere. Um, you know, uh, it's not hard to imagine that people walked out when Alfred Drake kissed her and when and why this from a producing standpoint why a producer would say uh no <laughs> it's not like it was being produced off broadway or at the 1940s version of the public theater it this was a commercial piece of theater right and and that was written to be delivered to an audience of upper class white people yeah. I mean, John knew what his audience was going to be. But th these writers, uh, Duke Ellington, this was his first, uh, was it his first foray into a, a book Broadway musical? Um, and they didn't have that kind of, and John Latouche um, was also sort of feeling his way. They didn't have that kind of power that Rodgers and Hammerstein. No, no they didn't. Not at all. Nor did they have those kind of savvy theater, savvy producers with a depth of background who were gonna, you know, I mean, it's not like how Prince producing Follies and dressing up the darkness until you're two thirds into the show before you realize that you're in the ninth circle of hell, you know, um, but it's been so beautiful, the journey down, the journey down, that you kind of don't mind. <laughs> and it, this was not, uh, there wasn't that kind of savvy production uh, behind this, you know, it was lots of people finding their way. We have, an, we have another number to share with you um, uh, by a cast member who sadly is no longer with us, Glenn Turner as Sneaky Pete. I want to be bad. I want to grow up to be bad. I want to be sweet and handsome. I want to go wrong and sit up. And be bad. I want to grow up to be tough. funny guy who could sing his face off hmm. and always plunge into a character head first. I miss him terribly. Me too. 100% original. Yeah. Nobody like him. And never did anything. If he played a role that had been, been played by somebody else, never played it the way it had been done before. It's always newly discovered. It was like he was writing it. Hmm. You know, a truly poetic talent. Maybe I should change my ways. Maybe sweet romancing plays. Maybe I am overdue for a love that's If I try to let temptation pass me by and really concentrate upon a girl who'd leave me anywhere. 
I should change my ways Well, something deep inside me says A man should really give a damn Or should I stay the way I am Or should I stay the way I am Forget it. Hmm. Jerry Dixon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Unbelievable. We've heard about, we've just heard a tip of the iceberg about the problems uh, it took to bring this show to Broadway originally. And, and a, a little bit of what it has gone through over the years. Why has there never been a full recording of it? I'm sure that um, it might have something to do with music rights. Um, they, the music publishing companies always interfere with any kind of creativity whatsoever. And when you get these great ideas about educating people and going back into research, and these, this material should be available to reach out, to be used, to whatever. And um, it just, we all just don't seem to be working together in the arts when it comes to that. The legal department, I mean, it's, it's so ridiculous and I, I have a hard time saying this because my sister, the Honorable Deborah Batts, who recently passed away last year, she was a federal judge. And so that's the other side of my family. So I tread on one side, the legal and the other side. And when I was invited to her house with people like judges and lawyers like Sotomayor and everybody sitting at the table and they're speaking Latin thing, language and so forth. And one day I just got so tired of it. I broke out and said, chasse pas de bourre glissade assemblé. And they looked at me like, <laughs> what were you saying? And just a different language, you know, that you we tried and music is the actual language. I can't help but think that, you know, there are there are treasures of African American work and treasures of uh, diverse multi ethnic musical theater that have not been uh, as supported in the same way as all white or predominantly white productions. The fact that, I mean, why is there no cast recording of Beggar's Holiday? Why is there no cast recording of Shuffle Along mm. with Audra McDonald, no less, who seems to be the, and no slight on her talent, the gigantic talent, but who seems to be the Oprah Winfrey of Broadway. I mean, everybody seems to love Audra, yet there was not even a recording of that show. Why are there, why is there brilliant black work and work created by brilliant black people that has not been recorded and archived and that has been lost is not known. And what do we do about it? That's the, that's the big thing is what can we do about it? because we can do something about it and must, you know? So I still hold out hope. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good point, Kent. And the, the thing that we can do about it is, is uh, leaders who can influence uh, budgets and line items must put that into any revival or new work. That right. it's part of it. It's, it's part of, you must make a recording. You don't have any say so in it. You're going to make a recording, That's but that it's part of your your uh, your responsibility of I, making sure that this work has a legacy. Go ahead, Tommy. I say also. I also to add to that point. I feel like we're all making a difference right now. I mean, I'm in charge of an arts organization. You are Jerry Kent. You're out there. I mean, all of us are are working toward promoting. Um, artists of color, women, you know, um, that's one of the things I've been doing the last two years. And I just keep it, if we just keep building upon that and making that something that becomes the norm, I feel like things are gonna catch 
and eventually we're all going to share in that power you know i hope (laughs) supporting writers when it's important you know saying not just that we're going to um license your work but when you come to our theater we're going to pay you for the weeks that you arrive that you work and toil not just the advance but the daily work to put into place those things that can say we value you you not just while you're on our premises but when you leave here and when we put you out into the world and your work into the world we value you so i think it's a it, you're right, Tommy, and Kent, it's a great uh, responsibility and, and one that I, I'm completely embracing because I think we, uh, uh, we're, we're way past, way past due. I, I, just think, I think that the audience comes to the theater and they, they want to be entertained, but they don't understand the work that goes on behind that, put that up on the stage. They just think everybody's up there laughing and happy and tapping and smiling, and they don't understand the research that was done behind that and for each individual character, whether it is movement or it goes, there's a history. Jazz is the folk music of America. And it needs to be treated as such so that when we are doing, no matter where we go on Broadway, or Broadway, movies, television, it's reflected in those places because otherwise people come up, they don't do research. There's not a lot of research going on. People just spouting out things and all of a sudden it becomes something and it just fades away just as fast as it came up. And they don't have anything about reflecting it back to, well, where did this come from? It, to add to your point, Mercedes, jazz is truly America's original art form. Yes. And right. it embraces it embraces the traditions of African-Americans as, as well as, um, as the classical music writing system. And it is, it, is, it is what America really is, which is a whole bunch of people getting together and creating something beautiful. I mean, it is basically our opera that came from Italy. It, opera is to Italy, I feel like jazz is to the United States. And, and I feel there should be so much more done to promote this, this art form right now. You know. Also, as Kent mentioned earlier, musical theater is uh, a, another equally important indigenous American art form. Yeah. It's better to have a jazz musical, a true jazz musical by greats of the form, gr- writing greats. It's, 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 a, it's obscene that it is not recorded and done everywhere. This is a great piece of writing that should be done. And if we can do anything at the York, even though we're homeless right now, uh, we will do everything we can to make this happen. I would love to work with anyone to bring this show to its rightful uh, position as, as an amazing piece of theater, musical theater and jazz. And this time without Dale Wasserman's improvements. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, with that, with that, you know, going back to Latouche's orig- two original intentions and to his to the original book, mm. because in many ways I think we've grown as you know as audiences as we've seen so much now in the theater and have experienced so much that. Mm, the things that are a little more sobering in the original material, I think the world is ready to hear and perhaps wants to hear. Um, And after the major revival that finally brings Beggar's Holiday to light, can we please have Queenie Pie? (laughs) (laughs) How is it that there is a genius opera by Duke Ellington that has only really been seen by the the audiences at the Kennedy Center production. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. third, this is you know, these are my passion projects for however much time I have left. <laughs> well, I have a thought, and I hope it'll put hope in everybody's heart. In 1999, when Beggar's Holiday was presented by the York and the Mufti series. Musicals in Mufti utilized a a slogan for promotion, Broadway's overlooked treasures in staged concert performances. 
Well, back in 1946, when Beggar's Holiday came to Broadway, the Three Penny Opera by Brecht and Weil was a decidedly overlooked treasure. It had been done on Broadway in 1933 for 12 performances. It closed and was not widely known to the, to the American public. Well, it's overlooked no more. And uh, if we're fortunate, Beggar's Holiday will uh, find new life and become as well known in um, the theater as the Three Penny Opera. So many wrongs to be righted, and uh, we have wonderful people here to make it happen. Let's work together and do that. It's a land that's fair to see. No legal jails or bargain sales. No telephones or TV. No need for crime. It's Thank you all very much for being a part of this. Uh, great to see you all. Um, till the next time. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers.